Thank you so very much for the invitation. I'm really honored to open this session with you today. So as you can understand, my job is to study these incredible environments. I study snow and ice around the world. And today I work with AMAP, the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program, which is one of the working groups to the Arctic Council. As you can imagine, snow and ice are environments that respond extremely rapidly to our carbon emissions. Speaking of carbon emissions, I wanted to show you this study that I'm sure you've seen before from the 1970s. In the 1970s, there were incredible scientists who knew very well that the more fossil fuels we burn, the more carbon emissions we will emit and the more temperatures we're gonna increase. And so the graph, this kind of old school graph you can see here on the right hand side, shows you the connection between increasing CO2 emissions and increasing temperatures. And back in the 70s, the scientists defined this trajectory that we could take if we were to continue burning fossil fuels on Earth. And what is quite incredible when you see this graph from the 70s is that today in October 2024, we are bang on on the middle of the trajectory in terms of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere and in terms of temperature increase. And the reason why I'm showing you this graph is of course, because this graph, as you probably already know, is from ExxonMobil. And so back in the 1970s, they had two options, either to listen to scientists and maybe, maybe reconsider the business plan or to bury this internal report and launch a global misinformation campaign, which is what they decided to do. And so today we have continued using fossil fuels to the extent that our climate is now profoundly, profoundly disturbed. Uh, this is an animation uh, from NASA that you can actually all find on, on YouTube, showing you how temperatures on Earth have evolved uh, for the past few decades, taking for reference the decades from the 1970s to the 80s. Everything that is blue is colder, everything that is orange and red is, of course, warmer. And unfortunately for us uh, in Europe, we are currently the continent that warms the fastest on Earth. Uh, along with the polar regions, the Arctic in the north, the Antarctic in the south, that are also warming extremely rapidly. So, of course, in response to this, snow and ice around the world is quickly disappearing. And I wanted to tell you a little bit of a, a story from my family regarding this. So the lady you can see on the left hand side is actually my great grandmother. This is a picture that dates back from 1916. And at the time, it was actually the beginning of tourism in the French Alps. I was lucky to grow up in the same environment. And just like her, I've always been fascinated by snow and ice. And in 1916, she decided to travel for a couple of days to stand on the glacier and to get her picture taken. And today I still do that. You know, I take a lot of classrooms, a lot of students to the glaciers in France, to the glaciers of the Alps. But this is what this very glacier, the Mer de Glace, actually looks like today. Um, there is not much left of it. Uh, the glacier is responding extremely rapidly to climate change. And these glaciers are still very much assets of our economies. You know, in Europe, we still depend on the fresh water coming from these glaciers during the summer months. We use this fresh water for drinking, for sanitation. We use this fresh water to produce hydroelectricity. We use it for agriculture. In my country, we we'll also use it to cool down nuclear power plants. And if you zoom out a little bit, in the world, it is 2 billion people who use fresh water from glaciers seasonally. So most likely during the summer months or during the warm season. So it's a quarter of humanity who relies on the presence and on the health of these glaciers today. But of course, if we continue extracting and burning fossil fuels, we will see these glaciers disappear, at least most of them during the next few decades. So we have a choice, you know, how much glaciers do we want to keep for future generations? How much water do we want to keep in these mountains for the years and decades to come? So this afternoon, I wanted to make you travel a little bit to a place that I love very, very much, where I spent actually most of the year, which is the Arctic. So this is where the North Pole is. And unfortunately, the Arctic is the fastest warming place on Earth today. The place where I live, which is the little archipelago of Svalbard, actually uh, close to Greenland, has warmed by eight degrees since the 1980s. And it's due to the 
basically the disappearance of the Arctic sea ice, which is what you can see here on the graph. In 40 years, we've lost about 40 to 45 percent of Arctic sea ice. And unfortunately, we very much depend on the presence of Arctic sea ice. It's a very wide surface that basically reflects solar radiation back into space. But as you can see on the video here, which is a reconstruction from NASA, sea ice is very much affected by the increasing ocean temperatures, but also air temperatures. And the, the latest scientific studies show us that it might actually be too late to save Arctic sea ice today. It may be just a question of time until we see some summer months in the Arctic when it's sunny 24 hours a day uh, without any more sea ice. And the consequences will be very dramatic. First of all, we're removing this white blanket over a very dark ocean. So it will catalyze the warming of the Arctic, melting Greenland, throwing permafrost, melting ice caps and glaciers even faster affecting the 7 million people who live in the Arctic. But also we're starting to recognize that this will heavily disturb weather patterns in mid-latitudes. So weather patterns in Canada, in the US, weather patterns all across Europe, and weather patterns also in Asia. And we're already suffering from extreme weather events that are directly related to the melting of the Arctic sea ice. It's not just sea ice that is responding very heavily, very strongly to the burning of fossil fuels. It's also our ice sheets. We have two ice sheets on Earth, Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right. Both of these ice sheets taken together hold enough ice to increase sea levels by 65 meters, 65 meters. Currently, Greenland loses about 30 million tons of ice every hour, year round. And the consequences, well, you know them already, is sea level rise, among other things. But sea level rise is a very important topic in Europe. This is what Europe looks like, at least parts of Europe look like, with a one meter increase in sea level rise. This could very well happen this century. This could very well happen before the end of the century. If we continue to see greenhouse gas emissions increasing in the atmosphere every year, um, we could get a meter of sea level rise as early as the 2070s. Uh, but it's really up to us to decide how quickly do we want one meter of sea level rise to occur. And as you can see, these actually very vast uh, portions of Europe that will be so terribly affected. And this is something we have to prepare for today. We won't wake up in 2069 realizing that sea level is coming. This is, again, something that we have to deeply anticipate. The last part of the cryosphere I wanted to tell you about this morning is permafrost, because permafrost is always a little bit mysterious. Permafrost is the frozen ground. In the Northern Hemisphere, actually 23% of the land mass of the Northern Hemisphere is permafrost. So we have a lot of it, and permafrost is frozen. So of course, as temperatures increase, permafrost starts to thaw. And the more it thaws, the more it releases its own greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, depending on the availability of oxygen. Currently, right now, permafrost is already emitting as much greenhouse gases as Japan, which is the seventh largest emitter in the world. But we can do a lot worse than this. So if we continue burning fossil fuels and seeing greenhouse gas emissions increase in the atmosphere, and reach 1.6 degree of temperature increase, permafrost will emit as much as India. So just to make myself clear, it would be as if we were adding another India in the world. Uh, if we reach two degree, it would be as if we would add another EU in the world, and three degrees is, is as if we were doubling uh, the US. So it's a very, very serious topic, and the more Basically, the more permafrost thaw, we, the more we must be ambitious about our targets of greenhouse gas emissions. I will leave you with this uh, graph here, which is to me probably the most important one to keep in mind when we think about climate and when we think about energy. It's a graph based on a study that was published in 2022 in, in Science Magazine, and The Guardian made this very easily, hopefully, understandable graph is basically the graph of our climate tipping points. Um, on the left-hand side, you have a series of ecosystems. I will start with the first one, Greenland. Greenland that holds enough ice to increase sea levels by six to seven meters. 
It appears that the tipping point of Greenland, which is here represented with a little red dot, is around 1.5 degrees. There's been more studies released since uh, 2022 showing that it might be actually a bit closer to 2 degrees. Let's hope so. But it means that, considering, of course, margins of error, which is the, are the, the red uh, horizontal bars, um, that once we go beyond 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, but for at least, at least a few years or at least a few decades, Greenland will start to collapse. And no matter what we do in the future, Greenland will continue to collapse. So this is a very important reasoning, a very important mechanism to understand that our climate is not like Oh, you know, the warmer it gets, the more the ice melts. But as soon as we start decreasing temperature, the ice will be healthy again. It doesn't work like this for all our ecosystems, at least for Greenland, for parts of Antarctica. If we go beyond certain temperatures, it will be too late to save these ecosystems, which calls for really ambitious adaptation, but also calls for extremely strong and efficient mitigation. So I will stop right there. I thank you again for your very kind invitation and I wish you really enriching debates and discussions. Thank you very much. Gee, thank you. <clears throat> As ever, you're brilliant and you're able to kind of project this information with a smile and a sense of optimism in your heart and you know all of us are thinking oh bugger you know we're doomed and but you know as what we like to do at Friends of Europe and we deliberately wanted to showcase this idea sharing from Heidi to kind of I suppose it's not it's not a rude awakening because we should know a lot of this but it's providing you with a, uh, an opportunity to peek into the future if we continue to do as we are. And Heidi's challenges, as you quite rightly say, we need to up the ambition, but don't think it's manana because man there is no manana in, on this agenda. So I wish that, you know, you could be at the uh, council meeting presenting this, uh, you know, to leaders so they actually see what's ahead of them. And, you know, good luck to you and thank you for as ever, promoting your message, especially I know you do a lot with children, young people and students. And, you know, uh, as a European Union leader, we've made sure and we hope to work with you again to make sure that you're in this kind of audience so that we are able to get the message across. Thank you very much again. Thank Heidi. you very much. Take care.